Welcome back to the Keep Pushing Podcast. Today I'm joined by Joe Monteleone, aka Joe Face. What's going on, man? Hi, Chad. How's everything? How you been? Uh, I'm all right. So we grew up skating together, been like what, 20 years, 25 years, maybe? I don't even know, honestly. But um, something like that. I think we were 13. So we're 13. We're you're gonna be 37 this month. Mm-hmm. So it's 24, 24 years. Wow. Yeah. That's the math. And um well, so you're the Dickies team manager, brand manager. What what's the actual term there? Uh it is the global brand manager and global team manager, which is fancy. sounds very sounds very fancy. <laughs> um but yeah, I've nice. been, been working at Dickies. Um October will be my completed uh tenth year. Somehow. Damn, really? It's been that yeah. long? Ten years. Dang. Almost. Yeah. So, so I got a question. I wanna I've known you, you know, twenty four years. Probably yeah. maybe longer. Um, and I still have no idea how you started skating, like how you got into it. Super random. Um, so my parents split up when I was 12. And I'm from West Babylon, um, which is, and you're from Lindenhurst. So for people who don't know Long Island geography, they are the towns <laughs> next to each other. So Southwest Babylon and North Lindenhurst butt up against each other. Um, when my parents split up, uh, my dad moved to Lindenhurst and I was like 11, 12 years old, I think. And, um, you know, that's where my room was. That's where I was living. I was still going to West Babylon schools the whole time, but, um, basically I just didn't have any friends in the neighborhood. And there were two kids on my block, uh, Lindenhurst kids, uh, Tim Higgins and John Frialias are their names. And, uh, they were skating. And, um, that summer, like moving into Lindenhurst, I broke my arm. Uh, the end of the school year, going to play handball. And normally in the summers, I played baseball. And uh, I couldn't play baseball all summer because it was my right arm. And my right arm was broken from like here to here. Mm-hmm. And uh, that summer, uh, I don't know if you remember, you remember Lino. Lino. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, Lino came to the house. He had a board. He just started skating like six months before that. And he was like ollieing and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then uh, these kids, John and Tim, were skating outside my house. Um, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was a thing, so I knew how to play that. And uh, I really like just kind of convinced my dad to go to Kmart and get me like a board so I could maybe make some friends. Really, it sounds kind of lame when you say it okay, like that. So but first, first board is a Kmart board. X Games Kmart board. No, <laughs> X Games. It was green uh, with a white X in the middle of it. So X Games. It was thirty five dollars. Trucks might have been metal. The trucks were metal. Wheels are plastic, piece of shit, barely rolled, um, bad shape, everything, just terrible, terrible board. But, you know, I would, I went outside and I was like, Hey, I'm, I just moved. I'm, I'm Joe. Like I just started skating and they were already like, you know, they could ollie up curbs and do little pop shows. We were kids. Um, yeah. so that was how I initially started skating was I just wanted to make some friends because I was like alone in a new town and that's where I was spending most of my time because after school, you know, I would go home to Lindenhurst or whatever. Like I would stay at my mom's in West Babylon for a little bit and then go back to Lindenhurst. And then on the weekends, it was at my dad's. So I didn't, uh, I was just trying to make some friends and, uh, skating looked cool because Lino was kind of already doing it. Um, and he had like, I just remember him cracking an Ollie out of my driveway and being like, well, that was, <laughs> that was cool. I don't know what he did, but that was cool. So that yeah. was it. Yeah. So, so how soon after that did you start working for like Chapman skateboards or at the shop? <sighs> Three, four years later, four years later, because okay. I was five years later. Uh, I was 12 when I started, I think. Mm-hmm. And then I started working there when I was like 16, 17. So it was probably um, a few years later. But um, I mean, you know, the deal. You just yeah turns into some kind of drug and that's it. Was that when we made that first video? Would you Were you working there already or did we start after you were working there? Um. New York State of Mind, I think we started making I think we started making it when we were like sixteen and we didn't really know what we didn't really know what we were doing at all. we I was just filming stuff because I wanted to make videos, right? Like the first video I ever really made um was on like one of those uh you remember that the they were like the tapes that you had to put into the tape to watch it? The, yeah. Like those cameras? Mm-hmm. So I had, I got one of those, like I asked my dad for a camera, um, or to help me buy a camera probably like two years later, like maybe when I was like 14 or 15 and, um, 
basically like I was filming with my group of friends that I was in high school with because there was like a little clique of us that skated. Um, it's like Lino, my friend Jake Byrne, who, you know, uh, mm-hmm. this kid Chris, this other kid Dave. And um, that's primarily who I skated with. We were like the five skaters in all of West Babylon. Like that was like I, at the school at that time, like that's who it was. So I always wanted to make little videos because it was like you watch pro skaters and you're like, oh, let's make a video. Like, let's just make videos. Like, that's what you did. Um, And then shortly after that, I bought another camera off of Paul Taylor. If you, you, I don't know if you remember, he went to school. I remember. Yeah, I know. He went went to school with Fuchs or whatever. And uh, he sold me like this high eight camera with like this shitty little screw on fisheye. It was maybe like a wide angle. It wasn't maybe even a fisheye. And we just started filming with that because it was a fisheye on it now. We went from yeah. like long dad cam to like this fisheye oh, thing. Yeah. And we started making that video, um, which turned into be New York State of Mind, which I don't know if you know this, but the whole reason that video even happened was because uh, Eric Twarty wanted to have a party and a premiere. And he was like, make the video with all the footage you have. So I edited New York State of Mind in 12 hours. The really? Whole thing, the whole thing got done in 12 hours on a <laughs> Windows Movie Maker in That's two, amazing. in 2005 or 2006 because we were filming for no reason for a few years and I just started like putting the clips together. So that was that first video. And it's yeah. really it's still online. It's really it's it's good for us. It's bad for everybody yeah. else. Right. Yeah, I mean, hey, I think it's still pretty good. I mean, 12 it's like an hour long. It only took you 12 hours. Yeah, I mean it's not edited good. You can see it, but it's, yeah. it was it was it's fun. Oh yeah, D- dude, Twardy did that to me twice. Strong Island was the same thing. He was like, I set up a premiere for Friday night. It was like Thursday. I was like, What do you mean? He's like, Make the video tonight. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Strong so, yeah. Island was the next video, and that's when we got like a little more serious about it. Like, oh, we're gonna film parts. We're we're you know, gonna go to serious, but. You know. Well, I mean, I think we had rules, right? So, like, the first yeah, video yeah. was um, we had skate park clips, like, whatever, you know, whatever you filmed, like, oh, you backside flipped the hip at Tanner, like, it's in the video, you know. Um, New York State of Mind, I think we had rules. We were like, street spots, like, you have to go to the streets, like, you have to do street tricks. Um, and that one we didn't film for very long. That one I think we filmed because if I remember right, New York State of Mind came out 2004 into 2005, like, that winter. Uh-huh. And then Strong Island came out the summer of 2006. So we didn't film that one for very long considering. But that one um, that one was me and Mike. Because Spanish Mike was a little bit more serious about filming. And we had cameras with like real fish eyes. Like I had a VX2100. Uh, um, he had like this mini DV like extreme handy cam thing that he would, eventually, yeah, he would eventually film Spanish Mike TV with. And uh, that was the second video. The second video was not that much longer after. And that one was like all street stuff. But that one, again, like got edited like less than 24 hours. The whole video. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny now looking back, like getting a little older and looking back, like you were kind of running the whole project. You know, you're driving around everywhere, filming, and buying tapes. Like now that you're a team manager, you're like, it's a job, but you don't really realize it like when you're young or I didn't at least, you know, you're just like, no, I think that, I think that's why I don't want to say I'm good at my job, but eh, I'm good at my job. But like, I think that's probably why it's like you're, you're trained younger. Cause like if you're, you're the filmer, you know, you have to like motivate your friends to be like, come on, let's go. Like, let's go skate. Like, let's go. But you know what the thing was like with us, it wasn't too hard because we, we wanted to do it. It wasn't like anybody was like really pulling teeth to go skate. Like we wanted to skate together. Like we wanted to do it. Yeah, yeah so everyone the, was psyched to go out. Yeah, it was it was a lot easier. It was a lot more fun. Um, honestly, I don't think I've had a better time skating in my life than those like last years of high school into like early college. Like that was the most fun I've ever had still. To this yeah. Day. Well, I um, mean, a lot of things go into that too. It's like you had no – not the same amount of responsibilities, like we were having skating, we were having fun. and stuff. You know, it's it's you know. Yeah, we were having fun. Compare because it's it's funny too because like if you look at my parts in those videos, like they're always kind of filmed the shittiest, <laughs> <laughs> which is cool. Yeah, um, Homer's but, cursed. They, they always have yeah. the worst parts. It was it was always good when Mike filmed, but like Mike wasn't always there. So sometimes it was Roy. Sometimes it was you. Sometimes it mm-hmm. was. I think even Fuchs might have filmed a few clips and they look like, you know, 
whatever. But um, yeah, but yeah, those those were those are probably the best times of my life. Those videos. So as we're you know we're doing that second video, Strong Island. Yep. At that point, are you thinking like you want to do something with this? Or are you still thinking like oh, I'm just making videos with my friends, like whatever, you know? Dude, the uh, the skating as a career thing was never it was never on my radar because I didn't think it was real. Um, at the time, I was working for Chapman. I was working for Chapman all the way up through my last year of college. Um, I basically graduated college like still working for Chapman, so I'm 21. Or whatever, and my plan was, uh, or the plan that was that I worked out with Greg was like I was going to help him. Me and Jeff Rhodes were going to help him, kind of try and expand Chapman again, like redo it, like blow it up, or whatever, you know. So that was my plan. But I went to college. I have a four year degree in three D animation or whatever. But when we were kids, I was just kind of like, you know, I I didn't really know like what was a job. It didn't really seem feasible because it doesn't seem feasible when you're on the East Coast, like, um, it still feels Seems really like a weird. Different world when you like think about California and skateboarding, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, dude, my life, my life's kind of like an accident, like the way that it worked out, because this was never, this is never really the plan. I don't really know what the plan was. I know this wasn't it. That's all I know. I knew that yeah, I was all right, so filming wise. You were like, this basically isn't even the thing. And then, but you were working at Chapman, so you thought maybe you could help grow the brand and like do that. Side. Yeah. And like the distribution side of everything. Cause I worked there for like six years or something. And what were you doing years. mainly? So it varied from year to year. So, uh, initially, you know, you just work at the shop, um, help Glenn with whatever he needed in the shop. Cause Glenn is the other Chapman brother for Glenn Chapman, Greg Chapman, Greg and Glenn own Chapman. Um, and I was just helping Glenn in the shop and whatever. And, uh, that was like kind of my job. And then, uh, they moved, they had something happen with the factory. So they moved factories and then a lot of Chapman wound up being like distribution for zoo. And then also like uh heat transferring boards um, and warehouse management. So Jeff and I were basically helping doing that. Jeff was more, we, the two of us were doing that. He was more along the lines of like invoicing and stuff like that. And I was like fulfilling orders in the back. And then sometimes I would do invoicing. Sometimes I would help Greg lay out art if he needed the help for like heat transfers and stuff like that. Um, which heat transfer is like the, it's like the sheet that goes on the board. You put it through a machine and it sticks to the board, whatever, through an adhesive. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were doing the, the, the warehouse stuff for probably the last two or three years of me working there. Um, was more that than being in the shop because, um, that was what they needed more help with. And, and Jeff and I were probably the right duo of people because Jeff started working there when he was 16. Um, they brought him into the warehouse before they brought me into the warehouse. I got a little bit older and then it was the two of us doing that. And we were fulfilling uh, zoo orders uh, when zoo was still really killing it um, for a few years and then kind of helping with the other aspects of the business. Um, okay. So you, you weren't like then you didn't really use any of that necessarily. You probably use more of like just, kind of behind the scenes, learning the business, meeting people, like that kind of stuff, right? Dude, I don't even know how many, like I met people who worked at Zoo and okay. um, people who like New York dudes, but like industry guys, like real, like dudes at other companies, like I didn't meet anybody until I, uh, until like way later. But, you know, the people who worked and uh, worked for Zoo or ran Zoo or whatever, like I'm, I'm still in touch with them, but like, the, you know, people uh, have moved on, but it wasn't, it was anything too crazy because like in New York at the time, the only two companies that you could work for where you would actually be able to like have a job where they would pay you like a legitimate amount of money was mm -hmm. Zoo and CCS because CCS was owned by Foot Locker and Foot Locker's headquarters were in New York. So those are the two companies that you could work for at the time on the East Coast before okay. like bef before like uh, you could really like be a filmer in New York and like make like a real amount of money because RB had that kind of covered. So yeah. it wasn't really like too many jobs, you know, it's just like you take RB's job. If you're lucky, you, you weren't going to be. And that was kind yeah, of, good yeah. Luck. yeah, good luck. Um, so yeah, it was, it was weird. I just, uh, I've done, like I worked all those back end jobs. So I've, you know, it was like fulfilling orders, like you transferring boards, screen printing t-shirts, sales calls for short ends. Like I was doing that, um, invoicing, uh, you know, the back end of running a skateboard company. I, I kind of learned all of that through Chapman 
and distributing zoo and like helping with supreme stuff because they were doing supreme stuff at the time um so all of that like back end information i got yeah. from my years at chapman so like yeah, actually you're seeing what sells, what doesn't like, so you're learning things you're not even realizing really. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, at the time you just, you just, you're like, it's skateboarding. Right. That's it. Yeah, you're like, not whatever. Even about it. Yeah. yeah. You're just like, whatever, I'm here. Um, but yeah, filming was never, yeah, I wasn't a very good filmer. I, I really wasn't, you know, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Like there's not like. When we were kids, like, there's nothing remarkable. Like, I can say this with confidence. No, there's nothing remarkable about what I was doing or filming. I think the idea was um, just I'm, I was always down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, the but, work ethic's there. The, the, the talent and the, equi- <laughs> and the equipment was not necessarily there, but um, the drive. Yeah, but at the same time, that's, like, any almost anyone's story, really, like. Yeah, yeah. Not, you don't like just jump into it usually and just have that kind of some people have a knack, but most things just take time, you know, so you just did it having fun, not thinking about yeah, whatever. And then so many years I added up before. You, it's funny looking back, like I worked at all these skate shops and skate camps and you don't really realize what you're doing. You're just like, you're just going through thing. it. Yeah. You're yeah. Just going through and it. then you look 10 years later, you're like, oh, all those things kind of like lined me up for where I'm at now. Oh yeah, you know and it makes sense, but at the time you just like think it's some pointless job, or you know. Yeah, whatever. I mean it. It all it all kind of plays into everything, and I think as long as you have like an open mind about it, like, um, you'll learn. You know what I mean? Like you'll learn from whatever yeah. these experiences are. Um. So you you were at um. So you were saying you were at Chapman, trying to grow it there, but you were like trying to decide if you were going to go to college or. No, I graduated. So what happened was I graduated college and the plan was, um, Greg had talked to me about it was that he was going to bring me on like full salary. Like you're going to work here. We're going to grow this, whatever. Um, I graduated in 2009, summer of 2009. Was it like business or anything? 3D animation. That's what my degree is. Oh yeah, yeah. You just said that. 3D animation. So what happens in 2009? Financial crisis. The economy collapses. Now Joe doesn't have a job. Job's done. Skating is done, right? So Chapman has to scale back because they got to stay in business. Um, at the time, I don't really understand that because I'm not paying attention to the economy. I don't give a shit. I'm just trying to skate, like whatever. I have no idea, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so now I'm 21, out of college, no job. What do we do? So um, that summer. <laughs> I got my shoulder reconstructed because I got hurt skating when I was 16 and okay. my shoulder needed to get done. Um, Chapman was nice enough to put me on unemployment. So while I was on unemployment and I was still able to have some health insurance, um, I got my shoulder done. Get done with that. Now I got to figure out, all right, like what's the next thing? And now at this point, 21, I'm like, I got to work. I got to work in skating still. I got to work in skating still. I got to work in skating. All right, well, what do you do? <laughs> Turns out Vans is opening up like a store in the mall. So I become like an assistant manager of a Vans store. That's right. I remember that. And what I was, was working yeah. I was working retail for like a year and a half. No, you okay. know what? Were I you didn't... manager or were you just I was like an just... assistant manager. Okay. So and uh that didn't really mean all that much. Those VF stores or the van stores. Um they kind of run themselves. You're basically just managing employees and making sure people show up and you know, yeah. help helping stock and restock and change out displays. Um, but I did that for almost a year. It was terrible. It was a terrible, like I am not cut out for standing around all day. It's not my thing. Um, yeah. So that was, that was hard. So I needed to do something else after that. Well, now what? I had a buddy and he was like, Hey, you can come do customer service at Geico and pay you better. And I was like, uh, all right. So I did that yeah. for you. I started doing that. I got a job at Geico, um, customer service, answering 105 to 120 phone calls a day, getting screamed okay. at by people. For yeah, people. how was that fun, dude? I, <laughs> looking looking back, right? Like, and I'm gonna sound how I sound. Like that was the worst. That was. I thought to myself at that point, I'm not even shitting you. I'm like, I would rather be dead than do this. This is this is <laughs> this is like, this is awful. I can't do this. This yeah. is a terrible way to live. But hindsight, right? I learned how to talk to people. 
I learned how to calmly talk to people, which I don't know if you remember, but naturally I'm a very angry person. So mm-hmm. I had to calmly learn people skills and I did it for a year and a half. Um, and that was like a really interesting training that I went through where it's like you learn to communicate calmly, nicely, politely. Cause a Geico, you can't hang up the phone. You're not allowed. So if you call Geico, you can scream at that person mm-hmm. and they cannot hang up. You cannot <laughs> hang up. And if they catch you hanging up, you get fired. I'm not kidding. Hey, that's a good muscle to, to build. You know, you just yeah. basically yeah, so, you put up with anything. If someone, you know, you're on a business call or something like, yeah, you, you can always kind of keep your emotions in check. And, yeah. And, you know, sometimes you can't. But when I was at Geico, I was like, all right, well, I don't really care. It's, custom, it's car insurance. I don't give a shit. Whatever. Yeah. So I learned about, <laughs> I learned a lot about car insurance. So I know a lot about car insurance. I learned a lot about people. But I did that mm-hmm. for like a year and a half. Um, so for basically two and a half, almost three years, skating was, skating wasn't really like, uh, we were skating because we were making the number three that whole time. Yeah. Like when I was like after New York State of Mind, like we were still doing the third video, right? So yep. we were still doing that the whole time. Um, actually, you know what? I, for, I skipped the, I skipped the part. I worked at the skate park at Tampa when I was in college because I went to Tampa for a year. I was going to ask that next. I didn't know where that was in the timeline. It was in there. So yeah, we, yeah. we jumped we jumped ahead of that, which was which was a, that was just a weird weird year in my life. Um, but yeah, so like that whole time we were still filming and I was still skating, but like the idea of like working in skating was at this point was out the window. That was, that was like not like a thing anymore. And then, uh, yeah, life like kind of threw me a curveball, like right after that. And it, it, it worked out because basically right after Geico, um, like I guess my career started, which was a weird one. So. Yeah. So how did that start? What was the opportunity? Um, Ray Mate owned Mighty Healthy. Mighty Healthy is based on New York. He was living in Queens, Brooklyn. And we had met through just Long Island skating stuff. Um, my ex-girlfriend had just bought me like a digital camera to shoot photos because I was like, oh, maybe I can like get good at shooting pictures and like Tony was shooting photos um, and he needed help with wedding stuff. And I was like, all right, well, I can make some money doing that. Like a lot of like this stuff kind of like transpired by accident. So, you know, I meet Ray and I'm like, Hey, like if you ever need some shots from mighty healthy stuff, like, you know, I'll, I'll just do it. Like I'm, I'm pretty down to just go shoot photos. Um, so he had me link with Gino a few times cause Gino was riding for mighty healthy and um, Gino was at home. Like poets was on the Island still. Um, Gino Iannucci for G- anyone. Yeah, Gino Iannucci for anybody who doesn't realize that. And um, so I was shooting photos and I shot a couple things for Gino uh, with Ray. Um, not very good. Not bad. Not good. Not bad. Uh, good enough for it to like, you know, Ray to be able to like post them or send them out to places or whatever. And then um, I'd done a, that with Gino a few times. And uh, this was right. This is right after number three. Um, so my filming is a lot better at this point. Not good. Still not good, but much better. And, uh, I had a digital, I had a DSLR. It was like the birth of HD, right? I couldn't afford a HPX. Um, mm. but I had a little D- DSLR and I had a fisheye. So, uh, pretty sweet's happening. Um, and I just kind of throw it out there to Gino, like, Hey, like if you need help filming for pretty sweet, like I'm around, man, like and for whatever reason, he said yes. And I was calling out sick from Geico <laughs> to go film anything I could of Gino to kind of like just foot foot in the door, whatever. Really? And that wow, um, I had no idea that uh, you were filming him at that time. That was that was the whole start of it because basically, um, oh, the other thing is like, so the camera that I had was the wrong kind of camera because there was right DSLRs and wrong kind of DSLRs. So the camera that I had, I had to sell and then rebuy a different camera and then rebuy all the lenses so that this way the footage kind of matched with whatever Ty was doing for Pretty Sweet. Right. So, um, but the thing was like, so I'm using my sick days from work and like you only get a certain amount of them. So I was calling out sick, like my boss knew what I was doing. You know, she was really cool. Uh, it's a lady named Lisa Grossman who was super cool to me. Um, but, you know, got to a point when the sick days ran out. 
And I was like, hey, like, I need to take another sick day. And she was like, you don't have any left. And I was like, can I just not get paid? And she was like, yeah, you can just, we'll just ding you. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. So you go from paid sick days to unpaid days. Um, so I'm filming Gino, you know, try lines in January at the seaport. Cold as shit. Like, just trying. Yeah, you right know? on the water. Freezing. <clears throat> yeah. Just fucking, just trying, dude. Just trying to get it, get it done. Um, Wait, hold on. So as you're doing this, is is this just like, hopefully this gets in the video and that would be cool? Or are they like, oh, we'll pay you for this clip or like, you know. I mean, they would have. So if you film something for a video and any company will pay you now. Even then? Yeah. I mean, even then. Okay. But <clears throat> the idea that it's going to be very much is not a real thing. It's not. Yeah. It's not a lucrative thing. Um, so what what was it like per clip at that time? What was this? Two thousand ten. Two thousand ten. Two thousand nine. Two thousand eleven. Um, mm-hmm. two thousand eleven maybe. Um, it wasn't much. It wasn't much. Like, okay. line was like one hundred fifty bucks, something like that. Flip was like a hundred. That's pretty low. Okay. It's still low. Um, but I didn't care. Um, Gino was my favorite skater, so just to for sure be there and like do that. I'm like, yeah, all right, cool. Um, but yeah, so that, that wasn't, um, that was just whatever. And then, uh, interestingly enough, that whole relationship that I have with Gino, um, changed everything for me because, um, do you remember Chase Whitaker? The name sounds familiar. So Chase used to be a sales rep for Converse and, uh, he got a job at Karma Loop running this thing called Brick Harbor, which was the East Coast's version of CCS, because now CCS at this point has been sold back to somewhere else. So Karma Loop was like a big online retailer and they have Brick Harbor. Let's take, take Brick Harbor. Gino is on Brick Harbor. So because I have a relationship with Gino and Chase knows me because he used to send Brian Clark shoes. So that's how I met Chase was through Brian Clark. Um, getting Converse flow, like the whole time we're filming the number three, Chase just goes, hey, do you want to try and film and shoot some stuff at Gino for us and we'll pay you a little bit of money? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll try and go out with him. And there was no real expectations or anything like that. And then from me filming with Gino, it turned into, uh, hey, PJ Ladd lives in New York and PJ um, rides for Brick Harbor too. Can you go film with PJ? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, no problem. 100%. Um, I'd never met PJ, but, you know, that whole thing led to that. And then Chase was just like, you know, this is that summer, like kind of leading into like the fall or whatever. And it kind of get cold and whatever it was. I don't remember exactly when I started, but basically at one point, Chase just goes, hey, uh, starting in January, like, do you want to be the team manager for Brick Harbor from just filming Gino and PJ? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. Sign me up. <laughs> yep. So that was in, I think it was like October, he asked me, and I was going to start in January for the new year, like new fiscal or whatever. So I quit, I quit Geico right there. Like I had like a little bit of money. Really? Yeah. Oh, dude, I was, <laughs> I was not going back to customer service. Like there was no shot. I still have the post, yeah. like, I mean, yeah, even if answer. it's significantly less, right? It's skating. So at that time, being young, you're just like, yeah. I was miserable. Dude, I was miserable. So, um, so I quit. I quit Geico. I was. I waited like you know the couple months for the checks to start kicking, and they did. Right. And then, um, then I took my first trip to California. I'd never been to California before. And okay, uh, so that's much different than getting paid per clip. Now you're like getting a salary, so a little more comfortable. You yeah, know? a little bit. If that uh, didn't happen, it's you know probably no. not likely to keep doing it. No, so um, you know you start out doing stuff for the love, and like it ironically started to work out. But at this point, um, I had gotten uh, I was filming and I was shooting photos at this time, so I had gotten to a point where I could shoot like a decent enough photo to like run as an ad. So you know, photos are getting published and like. Thrasher for Brick Harbor ads. I'm like running some photos. I'm getting some photos ran in some other magazines during like this period. Um, and the Brick Harbor thing didn't last very long. It was maybe two years tops. Um, but in that two year period, like, all right, now I'm in California. 
Now I work for this company that actually talks to other companies. So I start to build relationships with people like at Deluxe, at at the time Kale, like uh, you know Nike, um, whatever. Like I start to meet like all these people that uh, you know I now know and are, are my friends now. But um, at the time, like that was the first thing. Chase, you know, that was the timeline. So Ray Mate, Gino, uh, Chase Whitaker, PJ, like those four. You know that that sequence of events. Chase and uh, Ray really giving me the, the shot changed my whole life. And like my relationship with Gino changed my life. Um, it led into everything. And then when I got to California, because at that point I had put out like that video of PJ in New York, like that had come out. Um, that was kind of like a thing where like I showed up and people kind of already knew a little bit about me, which was weird for the first time in my life. So, um, yeah, dude, it was super strange. And then, uh, yeah, that's like what kickstarted the whole thing. It was really weird. Damn. So, do you think, was it like directly Brick Harbor that introduced you or was it kind of being in California? Just like, was it more easier to meet people and kind of... Well, so now I had a reason, to, now I had a reason to talk to people. So, you know, at the time, um, the Brick Harbor team, like when I started was Gino, PJ, Stevie Williams, Terry Kennedy, and Jack Curtin. So I flew in the winter time to go film with Jack and Jack and I put out an edit and I flew to... LA to go do like a thing with uh, Terry Kennedy. Um, and then I flew, I did some with Stevie Williams and like we put out these video pieces and like, I'm starting to put together like these uh, like YouTube still only like five, six years old at this point. So like the videos that we're putting out are like getting some traction. Um, and then, you know, Chase and I were like, all right, like who else do we put on? And together we decided on like adding like Boozenitz, uh, Jake Johnson, Day One, um, Leo Romero, you know what I mean? Like all these people started getting added to this Brick Harbor list and I'm going filming with all of them. So now I'm, I make a booze and it's edit. I make a day one edit. I make a Leo edit. I'm shooting photos and ads of all these dudes. They're like, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's all this stuff. So, um, my relationships with all of their brands are now developing because, all right, like here's this dude, Joe, he works with Brick Harbor. He works with Dennis. So now like all the deluxe dudes are really cool. And then I, you know, start to meet some people for Adidas. And like, I did, I did like a pretty good amount of stuff for Brick Harbor in that, uh, in that like two year period. So it really like opened up like relationships for me. Um, yeah. And, and that, and that was kind of it. That was like how it all okay. started. And it's, because that makes sense. You're just hustling and each guy you were filming a thing for was associated with a company. So if they needed something or, well, I mean, I was whatever. just, I was just meeting, and getting relationships and then uh just kind of being around like you just meet more people um okay but it was a it was an interesting thing but because of the fact that i filmed gino and pj people like treated me like a little bit probably nicer than they should have at least in, yeah in my brain that's how i remember it happening i remember it kind of being like a little bit nicer of a process so that's funny. So what happened with Brick Harbor? You said that would last what, like two years? So basically the summer, so two things happened. So the summer of 2013, um, you know, I spent my winter in, uh, I spent my winter in LA and my winter in San Francisco. Weather gets, I was sleeping on um, Buckman's couch in LA or his floor, mm -hmm. really. I was sleeping on the floor. And when I wasn't doing stuff for Brick Harbor, I was meeting all these dudes in LA and going skating with everybody and just kind of meeting people. And then I was spending, I spent a lot of time on um, Kevin Broncado's couch in San Francisco because Kevin's from Long Island. He moved to San Francisco. We're friends. I called him, kind of sleep on your couch and I slept on his couch for a couple of months. And I just kind of met people. Like I met all the GX dudes before they were GX, like Ryan Garchelle and like all his friends, like, they let me tag along because of Jake and they were super cool and I was just kind of hanging out. Um, so I met all those dudes at the times and then uh, all the dudes in LA. And then summer I go home, um, skating with, um, just skating, like kind of going around in the city because now I'm getting a paycheck. So it's like I can go skate a bunch. And uh, this is where Antonio DeRao enters the picture. Um, this is, yeah, this is like the summer that I find tea or like the whatever that year going into it. Um, so I'm just taking tea skating a bunch and, uh, filming video parts of him and like kind of doing whatever we were doing. And then, uh, that's 
So he's not sorry to interrupt. He's not so he's not writing for anyone at the time and you're just like, Oh, this kid's ripping, like let's film. Dude. He, and your bills are paid, so you're like, Yeah, well, like I could do this. Or, so at, how's it going? So at that time Oh, you know what? He entered a year before that. Okay, let me back up. The year before. Two that summer of two thousand twelve. I'm picking up I'm work I'm my job at Brick Harbor is happening. This is two thousand twelve. So I spent two winters going back and forth to California. The first, after the first winter, 2012 summer, I come home. No, what the fuck was I doing? (laughs) I'm living at my girlfriend's house in 2012. I'm working for Brick Harbor. I'm working for Brick Harbor. So that first, that first winter, I didn't go back to California. I'm working for Brick Harbor. Mm -hmm. I go to see my dad. Roy is living at my house in our downstairs apartment. We turned our downstairs into an apartment. My dad didn't want to rent it to anybody he didn't know. Rented it to Roy. Roy lived at my house. I didn't live there. Um, okay. So Roy goes to see this video called PJ Williams' Horrible Life. It's like a Long Island video um, made by this kid, Eric Hodek. And uh, Roy goes, you have to see this kid's video. Like, you have to see this kid's video part. You have to see this kid. So he shows it to me in San Antonio. And... I was like, who is this little fetus with who's switch? Like he's like 13 or 14 years old and he switched 360 flipping like five blocks on Long Island. And I was like, I don't like, I don't understand. So, um, I just DM'd him on Facebook. I was like, Hey dude, like I live at the time I lived in Bayport and I was like, do you want to go skate? And he lived in patch So I'd go pick him up and I would take him skating with PJ. That was, that was the timeline. So Antonio okay. enters the timeline 2012. So that right. winter into that summer, I'm filming Antonio and I'm telling Chase, I'm like, you got to see this kid. You have to see this kid. So I send him all the footage and he's like, this kid's insane. Um, so at the time Chase is working for Brick Harbor, he also starts Water as an Army with Mike Nucero. Um, puts Antonio on and I'm filming for them and putting together like a video and shooting all this stuff. And uh, we get Antonio on Nike Flow at some point and like his life starts to take off. Um, so fast forward. Um, that summer I break up with my girlfriend, uh, I move back to my dad's house and then the winter starts to hit and PJ asked me, this is, this is the, so I was flying back and forth in California to go do all those edits. And then PJ asks me to come back out because he needs to film an X games real street. That's what it was. So I fly out, I stay in California. I find a way to stay there for like six months, basically. Like, so I stay with PJ, I stay with Buckman. And then I stay with Kevin. So I broke up. I was like, I'm not coming back. I didn't come back for, I don't know if you remember, but like for six months. I should have wrote mm-hmm. this all down. I'm going to get, yeah. I'm going to confuse the fuck <laughs> out of people. Doesn't matter. So anyway, so I get back, yeah. film Antonio some more. That summer, 2013, PJ goes, Hey, can you move to California to help me film for plan B? Yeah, sure. So I sold all my shit, packed up my car. Um, Kelly Hart and Bobby Izzo took the drive with me mm-hmm. and we drove from New York to Atlanta, stayed in Atlanta for a couple of days for Kelly to film some stuff for KO and then drove to LA and then I moved in with PJ and I stayed at PJ's from October, November, December, um, January Brick Harbor ends and I don't have any money anymore. I used all my money, whatever I was living off of was not much. Um, PJ just kind of got back with his girlfriend and he asked me to like go like find someplace else to stay. So I'm jobless and homeless. January of 2013. Yeah. yeah January of 2013. I'm jobless and homeless. And so you're what, like, how does this work with the clips? Like if you, so if you get a clip, you're like, Oh, I got a hundred bucks. I can go like eat. Like, like how's that working? You know? So I basically needed to start figuring out like, okay, like what is it that I'm actually doing? Like, how is this actually going to work? Um, and, uh, I was staying at Buckman's for a little while and his house was a little hectic for me at the time because he moved out of the apartment he was normally in. He moved into a different apartment and the roommates he had were like Mm -hmm. a little crazier. Um, typical skate house stuff. I think this is, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is like 2013, January of 2013, January of 2013. And, uh, I called um, Sam Muller, who I knew from just industry stuff and like being in California and spending time. He's a photographer. 
uh, also happens to be okay. my best friend now. Um, but I didn't really know him that good at the time. Like I knew him, but not well enough to ask yeah. the favor that I did. But I was like, Hey dude, like I don't have a place to stay. Um, can I stay with you for a little bit till I figure this out? And, uh, Sam was a staff photographer for trans world. And he let me stay on his couch. He had two roommates, uh, Adrian Adrid and his girlfriend at the time. And Sam didn't ask them. He just said, Joe's staying here. He's staying on the couch. <laughs> so I stayed on their couch for like four months, dude. Like, damn, like legit, like four months, just saving money. And Sam introduced me to all the trans world dudes. And they were nice enough to let me film edits for like some money. Um, and I figured out at that point that like, if I can make an edit and send it to them and they use it, like I'll get paid much faster than if I film a street clip. So most right. days I was filming edits for trans world. So that first year that I'm in California, that's like what I'm doing. I'm just filming web content for trans world. Um, but I stayed on their couch for about three and a half, four months. And then I, I got a, a roommate and I got an apartment and I was able to like, Pay the bills and whatever, but still fucking. Yeah, but even, even at that point, probably pretty like, what are you like, 24 or something or 25? I don't I'm know. like 26, I think, at that point. 26? So you're probably thinking, like, all right, this is cool, but like, this is what I'm going to do forever. Like, is this going to pay the bills? Or are you not thinking that at all? You're just like, I'm surviving. I was like, basically cool. at this point, like, I had gotten a taste of what my life was like, and I wasn't ready to give it up. So. I didn't go home. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell them anything. I also don't, I don't have rich parents. Um, mm -hmm. so if this doesn't work, like I got, you know, my parents can't bail me out. Like there's no, yeah. there's no room. There's no margin for error at this particular point. Um, so basically what I figured out was that if I do X amount of edits a month, I can pay my rent. I can pay my car insurance. I can pay for my phone. And I can kind of eat. Um, mm -hmm. No health insurance because now I'm 26. So the health insurance is gone. So I don't have health insurance. So no money for health insurance. So can't get hurt either. Um, so skating, like me skating, slows down pretty heavily because I'm pretty responsible despite uh, how it looks on paper. Yeah, no, no one wants to run into that. You no. run like something. Break an ankle and you're facing like a hundred thousand dollar, yeah, you know, bill. Or something. Yeah, yeah. No. so I'm not, I'm not really doing that. So, um, yeah, move in with this girl Rachel, who's uh, kind of dating one of my friends. She needed a roommate. I needed a roommate. The rent was cheap. My rent for my half of the apartment was eight hundred bucks a month, which was feasible. That is feasible. Um, so I'm selling products really that people are giving me. Um, I'm hustling trans world edits and i'm just trying to make it just trying to make it through like that's what's yeah. really happening so so did you like so you filmed the trans world video duets that's years later right yeah. so oh it's years later years. Oh, okay i thought that was something you like proposed to them to try to change your situation or something like that i don't know yeah so that was that was years later so i was just doing web edits for them um, okay. for a long time I did all of 2013, all of 2013, I'm basically hustling whatever edits I can do for whoever will pay me to do edits and filming mm. street clips is not really a thing because it's not like you film a clip and you'll get paid for it right away. You get paid when the video comes out. So if I film a clip of whoever, and it comes out in two years. Like, I'm like, I gotta wait two years for a hundred dollars. Like there's no shot, you know, like that's what I was going to ask him before was like, you, you're doing this thing with PJ. You got no money. It's like, do you get that hundred? Like so, each clip you send in or you gotta wait till like it comes out, you know? So when Brick Harbor ended, um, basically plan B was kind of like, Oh, we're going to, we'll pay you. Um, they never did. So, hmm. you know, like I started to kind of like have to like go, find money because I have car insurance and gas and food and trying to like whatever. Yeah. So I had to try and figure it out. And Sam helped me figure it out with like the trans world stuff. Um, but that first year, that 2013 year I did, uh, I think most of the web edits that came out were came from me. I did, I think 88 of them in one year. 
<laughs> oh, you cranking them out. You guys need more content. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> that was the thing. So I figured out like, they were like, oh, we have manual Mondays. I was like, done Mondays. Mm. Trick tips are on Fridays. Uh, I can do these other edits. So like I'm cranking out edits and I'm basically doing a few a week and I'm sending in the invoice as soon as they come out. Boom, 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 boom. And, uh, mm. the, the lady who pays the invoices at trans world was super, oh, was super nice to me. Um, it was actually Matt Hensley's wife, Desiree, Desiree Hensley, um, was like, you know, she was, she was doing all that stuff. So she was hooking me up and she would get my stuff paid because she kind of knew my situation. She was super cool. But I was going, I would, I would take people from LA, drive two hours to San Diego to film stuff in the Transworld Park, but I would pack the car with like three dudes. So I'm like, we're filming, yeah. I'm like, we're filming three edits today. Like three edits are happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like these are getting cranked. Yeah. Um, and that was like me helping them. And it wasn't for, it wasn't for like a lot of money by any means. Like it was not for a lot of money, but, um, that I think that filming all of the skate park stuff and filming Antonio was what made me into like a good enough filmer to be like at the, at that point, like professionally paid, like all that skate park stuff was like, mm -hmm. that's training day, man. That's just sitting there yeah, training day, but with like people who are really good at skating. Right. And, uh, it changed that change. Forced me to kind of up your level, you know, you don't want to fuck it up too. So like, you know, you're filming clips I, of day one. You're like, all right, well, I can't blow this. Like, how am I going to make this like whatever it is? So you really spent a lot of time those in that like two year period of like brick Harbor. And then that year period of trans world, like really trying to figure out like how to, how to make it look the best that I could. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that was all of 2013, like doing that. And then, um, the street stuff I was helping with was, uh, I'm really good friends with Neen Williams. And that's kind of like when I met Neen at that time and I was helping him film for like outliers. So that was the first time my clips got used in like a trans world video. That wasn't, um, okay. that wasn't like, a you know, like a skate park edit or something. So. Okay. So how did the video come about then duets? Was that just, so you were involved and then you just kind of pitched it to him or, or so did they come to you? So it was actually a few years later. So basically in, I would keep working for trans world throughout 2014 into 2015. But at the time, I started working for Dickies in October of 2014. Um, oh, okay, so that came first. That came first. I don't really want to talk about it too much, but basically, like, I still needed to work a second job for a while. Okay. Um, so. And what were you doing at the start? Oh, uh, Dickies? Yeah. Team manager. Okay. That was my job. Um, so I was, and that was a weird one too, because these dudes from Texas found me on LinkedIn and cold called me. That's how I got the, really? that's how I got the job at Dickies. That's wild. And you weren't like being, just hopping in and being the team manager. You're basically building on the entire skate department, right? Cause they didn't have any skate stuff or did they? They did for a few years. Um, by the time I kind of got in there, it was like dwindling pretty hard. So the first year of Dickies was like really difficult. Um, and then the second year got much easier. And, uh, that was able, when I was like able to start, uh, kind of rebuilding what they initially wanted to do because they came in kind of like guns blazing. And then, um, some things kind of changed before I started there. And then by the time I got there, uh, the program was dwindled down pretty bad. And I was trying to basically, uh, keep it, keep it moving, keep it going. But so I was, okay. I was working through for trans world all the way through, um, 2015 basically. And, um, start of 2015 was basically when I was able to like take full, uh, or October of 2015. No, I was working through, I was working for trans world and doing freelance edits and freelance filming and all this stuff, um, through 2016 of October. But I'm going to rewind. So okay. when I started working for Dickies, my buddy Mike uh, told me he's a film director. And he was basically like, if you can get a red camera, I have work for you. So I'm still not making very much money. Don't have any steady point of employment at this point. Still, even with working at Dickies. Um, okay. I went to Red 
and finance the red camera. Really? Yeah. Because I was like, it was pretty expensive, right? At the time, yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot. I was, yeah. I was, uh, Danny was my, my girlfriend, um, moved in with me. Um, so it was me, her, and my roommate. And I was talking to her, and I'm like, this is like really risky. And she was like, he said you can make money. And I said, yeah, because at this point, it's like, all right, well, now we got to make money. Like, now what do we do? Um, so I got this red camera and I financed it. And I was like, if I can work a job a month and use this red camera, the red camera will pay for itself. If I can work more than one, now we're in the green. So mm -hmm. risky, but it did it. So I financed the red camera, um, which is a lot of money. A yeah. lot, a lot of money. Um, and yeah, I'm sure it's scary investment at the time. Yeah. You're like, yeah. Yeah. Back in 2000, 2014. Yeah. So I financed this red camera. Dickies hires me and I'm still doing freelance stuff basically to like pay bills all the way through to January of 2016. January of 2016, I'm full time Dickies from that point on. Um, Dickies was always kind of like a, it's a corporate, it's a corporate company. Corporate company full of people who don't understand skateboarding. So it's a lot of education um, and teaching people about skating and stuff like that. So it was always like a bit rocky. So um, 2017 rolls around. You know, 2016, 2016 happens. Um, team's going good. We're doing like little edits. Um, Instagram, like growing that. And, you know, just figuring out, like figuring out growing the brand. Um, I got the Instagram account. Uh, we were at zero followers. So... I picked up an Instagram account from zero followers. I taught myself how to grow a social media audience. Um, so, you know, we're, we were doing that basically from that point. And then um, fast forward to duets, basically Transworld had done 29 videos and I'm still tied with all these dudes. And uh, they basically said, um, you know, we're not going to do a 30th video. So I called them um, and I was like, Hey, like me and Buckman are coming down. Like, we have an idea for a video. Like, we'll see you guys tomorrow. So I called Buckman. I was like, hey, we're going to Transworld tomorrow. We're going to go pitch a video. And he goes, what do you have? I was like, I don't know. I'll figure it out. So I figured out what we were going to do, what we were going to call it, all of it, on the way down to Transworld. We had no idea what we were going to pitch. We had no idea what we were going to do. But uh, that night, I figured out what I wanted to say. And then Buckman and I like fleshed it out when we were in the car and when we went to pitch it to him. But we were like, we'll do... A five part, all split part video, we'll call it duets. And this is who we have on board. And uh, the people I said we had on board, like we didn't have any of them. I just kind of was just like, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, so the original lineup uh, kind of fluctuated a little bit. But um, for the most part, like we got a video done. Um, so I made the last trans little video that way. And we would. That's honestly, I, I love that concept. Yeah, we like. I wonder if they would have said yes without like a, a solid concept like that. Because I feel like it was just so kind of clearly laid out. I don't know. You know, for the it was or maybe I don't it know. would have been a lot easier if we didn't if we just did a five person video. I'll say that much. Well, yeah. Because now, now, you, <laughs> like, cause the, my thought process into it is because like I'm very like math driven. Um, mm -hmm. My thought process going into it was like, okay, if there's ten of you. Now you only need to film 15, 20 clips each. Yeah. Um, hold on. Sorry. Now there's, you only have to film 15, 20 clips each. Let's see for the light. Um, and, uh, basically that backfired because now it just made people be like, Oh, I don't really have to do that much. You know what I mean? So like it was really hard to kind of get done. Um, but the other thing that happened was most of the video winds up being Dickies dudes. Because okay. in 2017, we have no Dickies projects on the board because, again, corporate company, a little bit weird, a little bit of a weird year. So duets was my my answer. Duets was my answer to basically having the guys appear in media so that something would happen around Dickies guys. And then uh, I got Dickies and New Balance to sponsor the video. So I brought in the sponsors and like kind of helped that happen along because most of the dudes in the video – Either rode for New Balance or Dickies or both. Okay. And uh, duets. So that worked out that you had the Dickies kind of guys there because otherwise it sounded like you might not have a lineup or or, um, or you probably could have just found someone eventually. Right? We had some dudes that were like set to be in the lineup and then like mm -hmm. they wound up being um, 
it wound up being like more Dickies guys than normal. So like, um, I remember basically like Jake was going to split apart with, uh, someone else, not Frankie Villani. I can't remember who at the time. And then Jake was like, what about Frankie? And I had never met Frankie and I was sending him pants, but I had not really like ever known him. And then through that process, I was like, oh, you need to ride for Dickies. So Frankie started riding. <laughs> yeah, skate with him once. You're like, oh, okay. Oh, I'm like, oh, you're the best. You're like one of the best skaters I've ever seen. So yeah, you're, you're in, you know. Um, and then uh, Ronnie was in, Zach and Vince were in. So it wound up being, you know, like we had um, like four or five dudes, five dudes, five dudes out of 10 were Dickies dudes. And then Damn. two out of five were, or three out of five were New Balance dudes. So it worked out that majority of the people in the video were between these two sponsors and that brought in the sponsors. But we worked on that video for about 18 months. Um, and are you going out with, is every, like people going out in groups or you kind of have to go like individually? Like it seems like a lot to keep, kind of keep track of and, you know, it was, stay on top. Of. It was schedules. So like, that's the other thing that you don't think about. I have like this really big problem where I just go, can't be that hard. And I just jump into something without really thinking it through and then being like, these are 10 professional skateboarders with 10 professional skateboarders schedules. So a lot of it was like, all right, I'm going out with this one person today. And we didn't do that many trips for the video. Um, but fortunately we were able to like get some money to have some people like help us film the people that we couldn't really get to all that much. Um, okay. But yeah, the video video took about 18 months. So it was like one of the longer trans world videos at the time. Um, but it was the, it was the, uh, it was the last one. So that was really proud. It was a proud moment for me. Um, yeah, you know, you get to make a video with one of your best friends, two Long Island guys. We're not supposed to be, yeah. we're not supposed to be making trans world videos. Yeah. What? Well, so you're making the 30th, 30th and kind of chapter ending trans world video as you've grown up watching them. Yeah. Idolizing your them. whole life. Yeah. Idolizing them. Yeah. And then uh, it was a finale. So that was how that happened. So, but that's why. Yeah. So basically that's like the, the transition. There was a lot of, there's a lot of bits and bobs. Like I worked a lot for a really long time. <laughs> To get to a point where it's like everybody, you know, you look at it now and you're like, that was, that must have been so easy for you. Like this whole thing has been a fucking, uh, yeah. mountain climb. That's usually what it takes. A lot of times it's like the sacrifice of like making nothing or just doing people favors and kind of, yeah, giving yourself the opportunity for something to happen, you know? Yeah. I mean, dude, it's a, it was like, there's a weird drive that I had where I'm like, I can't, I can't go back to, not doing this. I cannot go back to customer Geico. service at Geico. I cannot do this. Um, you know, and uh, skateboarding affords you like a certain amount of freedom. It affords you a certain amount of fucking frustration with pro skateboarders. I love them. However, yeah. you know, it's a little skateboarders mm -hmm. are not the easiest people in the world to deal with. Um, myself included. Definitely. Even just the industry as a whole, really like it's, a lot harder to do almost everything there. Like a lot of these guys, you got no health insurance. You're not like, so you think about your future. Yeah, dude. As a skateboarder, you know what I mean? Or it's just like. You got a window, man. You got a window where like it's either going to work really, really well or it's not going to work at all. And then uh, the hard part is like that window is getting longer um, mm -hmm. for people to like keep hanging on. And it's like, it's a really, it's a really tough industry. And for you to make like a, a livable amount of money, not even like a money where you're like really flourishing, like it's Los Angeles. So it's really hard. You need, you mm -hmm. need everything. You need everything to click. And then you really just start to make like actual money if you have like an energy drink. But aside, okay. but aside from, yeah. or being like one of the top dudes at like one of the big shoe companies. But if you're just like a mid tier dude, like you're basically just along for the ride and like you're enjoying your time, you know? So, well, that's the thing too, is like, you could be doing okay, but then okay at like 35, 40, then you're like, yeah, you know, things start to dwindle, opportunities yeah. get low and you're like, oh, I didn't make as much as I really thought, you know, and then you think about your future. Yeah, it's tough, man. Bobby's not working as well. So what, what would you say is like, if you were going to tell a kid, give the best advice to like go about it? 
You know what? What would you tell, dude? It's a you're up against a lot of stuff. Um, it's like playing chess. You have to make all of the right choices and kind of make yourself be seen. Like it's not as easy as, oh, I'm really good at skating. This is going to work out because that's not that's not true at all. Um, if you ride for if you ride for a company just to get free stuff, that's going to affect how other companies look at you. Right. So like, I won't name names. You ride for company mm -hmm. X. I personally think company X is whack. I don't want to be associated with company X. You're never going to ride for Dickies. Mm, okay. It's true. So like it's so you have to be selective. You're saying, yeah, you can't be jumping into stuff. So like a lot of stuff that happens to kids is they go, I'm really good. I'm going to get this free product, but you're taking this free product now. And in the moment, and you're now branding yourself and you're branding yourself within this sphere where everybody's looking at everything else. Like your board sponsor, who you ride for as a company man matters for like what other opportunities are afforded to you. Right? So like, for example, if you ride for FA, like your options are much better than if you were to ride for, um, a different company. Target. Yeah. So a different yeah. company. Right. So like, you ride for FA now, like you can kind of like almost finagle your way into any of the shoe brands, like the big shoe brands, and you could probably finagle your way into riding for Supreme. These are bigger opportunities in terms of like exposure and then other opportunities outside of that where it's now like, okay, well now I, I ride for Supreme. I can model for Supreme. And now that I'm done modeling for Supreme, now I can model for, now I'm a runway. You know what I mean? Like it affords you these other things that kind of change your trajectory. Um, social media kind of does the same thing too, where it's like your money can be made other, other places, but like pure core skateboarding, like you need to make the right choices, which is hard. And okay. So let's say you're a core skateboarder. Mm -hmm. You're pretty good, but you're not maybe the top, like what 2% that make like that great money. So maybe you're the top 5%. Or top 5% is still really like good. That. I would say if, if, or 10, yeah, maybe 10%. Like you're just down a little bit. You crush it, but. Do you keep trying to go that path or do you lean more towards social media? Like, or, and should everyone be leaning more towards the social side? It's like, where do you draw the line in terms of, of, uh, you know, making a living off? I think you have to do both. I think you have to be, it's a really, it's an interesting time because I think you have to be one cool, right? Cool. And then you also have to be socially relevant. And that line of like, cool, I'm not saying like FA Supreme cool or whatever, or whatever, you know, version of cool you're listening to. I'm saying like, there's like people who are cool, right? Like, and that personality shows through. So it's a bit of both. Skating, being really, really good is really important. But if your personality is trash, I don't really give a shit how good you are. I'm going to hang out with you. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be, be around you because now I got to spend time with you. And if your personality sucks, like... It's not going to help you. I don't want to. I don't want to do this. Like, if you make my life harder for you to do like a kickflip front board down a handrail, like I don't really care. There's another kid who can do it. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm saying. We have to be like, yeah. be cool. Um, yeah, no, that's very. That's important. I've seen a few people lose their careers or opportunities because of that. Yeah, and it's a. Uh, it's basically like you have to. You have to understand every part of the game. Like, just be nice, be cool, try your hardest, be polite, show up. Skate hard, do the social stuff. Don't be whack about it, but be you know, just do it. Play the game. Mm. Ex like expose yeah. yourself in not like a weird sexual way. Just like try and uh, yeah. try and do your best to make yourself seen in the, in the best light possible. And uh, if it doesn't work, you tried your best, and that happens, and that's okay. So, and what about for a filmer? What would you say for someone on that side, dude? So I took a job as not a filmer to be able to film, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I film and that, and you know, I make, I make money doing that now too, where I have been the whole time. But like the primary source of my income was not a filming job because of skateboarding, because you have to think about how many companies there are and how many filmers there are. And then if there's that job that you want at like whatever company it is, if it's like a bigger company, like they're probably already taken care of. 
So those jobs that you're affording yourself are like not really there. So you have to kind of create like a niche for yourself, I would, I would say. So like, um, and that usually turns into something really good. So like, for example, um, Jacob Harris uh, films his friends and they created the Atlantic Drift series. And then that affords him other opportunities to go film for companies. But like Atlantic Drift and that crew of people allowed him to kickstart a career. Uh, Johnny Wilson was making his videos and that allowed him to kickstart a career. Ryan Garchel was doing the GX 1000s and that was his crew and that afforded him to kickstart his life. You know what I mean? Um, okay. But those those things where it's like, it's kind of the same thing that we've always done where you're filming your friends. And if your friends are interesting enough and the industry can take note of it and get care of it, like you can create like a position for yourself or you have enough juice to start your own company. You know what I mean? Like that's another thing, but like the filmer's job, like like if you're like a kid from Long Island, right. And you're like, I'm going to become a filmer in skateboarding. You got to show up and you got to do the work. And then you got to understand that, like, you're going to be like, you'll be eating some shit for like a long time. And then it's like the same thing. It do it's the same exact thing. It's like, it's kind of like who you're filming and what you're doing. It's all, yeah. it sounds shitty, but that. No, it's like, it makes sense. It's almost like a pyramid where it's like, you know, most people fall off because of how hard it is. You're not really making that much. You're trying for so long. But to get to that incredible spot where you're making a living off of skateboarding and traveling, it's hard. You got to eat it so long. It's hard, man. There's, to get there, there, so if you give up, it's, yeah, it's hard. It do it's hard, and uh, I think that that's the if you want it bad enough, and you have the ability to because most most filmers and photographers that I know aren't just skateboarding. When myself included, we're not just doing that. Because you can make a lot of money not in skateboarding, and that can and that can fund skateboarding. You know what I mean, or like do, do whatever you do. Um, yeah, it's funny when you think about skateboarding filming because you'll film someone do a trick for like three hours for like a three second clip, but you can go film a commercial for like ten times the money for like an hour. Yeah, not very much. So like, yeah. it's it's all relative, and it, it really all depends on like who and what and like what it is that you're trying to do. Um, numerically, it's like, that's why you get the better cameras. Like I didn't get the red camera cause I was like, can't wait to film. Like, okay, I can go make a thousand dollars in a day now cause I have this camera. And if I do three of those a month, four of those a month, like at the time, 25, 26, like no money, I'm like, oh, it's not that bad. It could be worse. Yeah. And then, well, I, I think what really made you like make, be a success at filming, I think is that you put yourself in that vulnerable position of like, I don't know if this is going to work. So I have to figure it out. I, I got to get this camera. I got, you know what I mean? Because if you don't do that and you're just like, Oh, like this isn't working. Well, I think that's, I think that's uh, like, the, that's true to my personality. Like I'm not, uh, I'm too stubborn and too stupid to quit. Really. I'm going to see it through whatever, it, whatever it is. Like, you know, anybody that's ever, worked with me or worked alongside me like knows like i am too stubborn to quit and i obsess over things and i think about things too much and like even the guys who work for me now like they're like dude put your phone down like go to bed like why are you texting us this clip at 11 30 at night like shouldn't you be asleep like why are you t you know what i mean like this this obsession um in my brain has allowed me to like be too stubborn to quit and i think that's a big portion of it and that i'm uh Hopefully, like, not annoying enough to, like, people can just be around me and just be like, all right, this isn't so bad. So I know I have my things, you know, like, I'm, I realize it. Like, I, I'm not numb to the fact that my negativity and stuff like that, like, probably affects people. But whatever. I try. Hey. I'm, yeah. No, it's funny you say that because I think that that's the quality that made me kind of you know, skate across America, do all those things that like obsession, you know what I mean? You just get like locked in and you're like, bro, let's, I'm not, I don't care what I, I'm finishing this. Bro, know? let's talk about being friends with you. That's, that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. The idea that you've done these things, like knowing you, how long I've known you and the, like, I thought you were nuts with the 50 States thing. I was so worried about you the whole time. I was like, this is going to be fucked because you didn't have any money. 
and you were doing it by yourself. And every day I was like hoping to God that that would um, pan out, you know, um, whatever. So, <laughs> yeah, that one was funny because I mean, this one was, it was still, you know, risky, but that one I had truly no money and I was just like, all right, hopefully people like it and someone throws me a couple bucks because otherwise I'm just stuck in the middle of the country, you know. <laughs> Hold on one second, sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that trip was like, I don't know. Yeah, that, that early on one was a little more raw, you know. Yeah, that was that one was crazy. And then you skating across the country, I'm just like, like come on, dude. Like that's nuts. So it's it's like it's it's scary being your friend sometimes, like from far, because I'm just like, oh man, I hope he doesn't fucking burn out. I hope he's okay. And it's like nerve wracking yeah. the whole time because it's not like a week. They've been fifty day plus things both times. I'm just sitting there watching the internet like everybody else, being like, oh god, I hope he's all right. Like this is crazy. It's just hey, I I enjoy doing it, and honestly, I think you've said this before. I think it stems from. We grew up skating together. I've been making videos and doing stupid stuff in front of the camera for 20-something years. So that's just what's fun to me. Like, all right, I'm going to go do this project, and I'm going to film and document it. You yeah. Know? I mean, whatever it is. It's... I feel like you've been doing the same, too. You know? <laughs> too, too stubborn equipment. It's really really where we're yeah. at. <laughs> just too too dumb to quit. Um, I mean, it, work, it works yeah. out. Kind of. Yeah. So Hey. You made it. Yeah, I so I'm so, so far, you know, thirty it's gonna be thirty seven this year. The idea that this has been uh you know, working in skateboarding minus with the with the uh the omission of two and a half terrible years that I've been doing this since I was working in this since I was sixteen, so for you know, twenty something almost twenty something years of my life is is pretty remarkable at this point. Um yeah. I keep, no, that's incredible. Yeah, keeping the Peter Pan syndrome alive is, is like I'm I'm really <laughs> like I know how fortunate I am. I, I we all know how fortunate we are to be able to do this. Um, it's just like an interesting, it's an interesting thing. So for sure. So do you have any, um, future projects coming up? Anything you're working on? Diggy's video. Um, Diggy's okay. video coming out this summer. Been working on it for, for okay. like two years. It's called honeymoon. Okay. Um, full length. Uh, just trying to finish that up. Um, finish the next we got a couple trips coming up in the next couple months they'll be like the last filming trips and then um i'll start putting it together like april may so nice so oh yeah and then what about are you still doing that podcast sam and joe or no no, no. set some micro people want no nah, i don't know uh <laughs> we were that was like a COVID thing like dickie's was, okay. Dickie was like hey you know what can you guys do? And we're like, oh, we could do a podcast. Because uh, our angle was like, I don't know if we ever explained the angle. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. cares. But so like, you know, we, we only did a couple episodes. But the idea yeah. was that our guest would be somebody that Sam and I were both there filming and shooting their tricks. So the idea is we can talk about the trick from all three perspectives. So it's like the photographer's yeah. perspective, the filmer's perspective, and the skater's perspective. So this was way – this was – this is our thought process. Like, oh, like we'll do the Dickies team. And then, you know, we've shot like however many people over the years. So you can bring in Sam shot a lot more people than I have. Cause he's. Yeah. I like the concept. Yeah, we, 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 we tried. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Um, <laughs> the signs in my garage, the sets in my garage. Oh, we'll see. All right, well, let me know if you're going to bring it back. Yeah. I mean, I, skateboarding podcast. We'll, we'll do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know if anybody, I don't know if anybody wants to hear me talk too much longer. So, um, dude. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I'm psyched for the honeymoon video. Thanks, Sorry. I just talked. Yeah, so hopefully much. I can get a clip in it. Maybe. Yeah. You can put you in, put you in, uh, I'll put you in Vince's part. Nice. And, um, take care of your foot. Hopefully that heals up. Yeah. Well. I'm going to go straight to the doctor right now. So, <laughs> all right, all man. Right. I'll hit you later. All right, good catching up. All right, you. late. Good.